Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Coffee Chat with Experts. I'm your host, Laura Moriarty, and today our topic of discussion will be all about flow cytometry. I am very pleased to introduce my esteemed colleagues and give everyone a warm welcome. First up, we have Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Chris is joining us from sunny California. And Chris has been working on supporting Biorad's flow cytometry and cell biology platforms, both as an R&D scientist and also as a product manager. And he's been at Biorad for five years now. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. And next up, we have Danielle. Hey, Danielle. Hi, good morning, Laura. Good morning. So Danielle is based over there on the East Coast, and she has spent the last 12 years learning and eventually teaching flow cytometry as both a postdoc and a core manager. And she joined Biorad just over a year ago. So we're really happy to have her join us today. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you. And next up, we have Michelle. Michelle is also based in California. Hey, Michelle. Good morning. Morning. And she's been doing flow cytometry as a principal investigator and core manager for over 20 years. And she's been at Biorad for just about four years now. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you. And then last but not least, we have Mike. Hey, Mike. Hello there. Hello, and uh, Mike is actually joining us from Northern Ireland this morning, so this afternoon for him. <laughs> so he uh, has lots of experience with flow cytometry, and he did flow cytometry as an academic researcher for about 19 years, and he joined Biorad five years ago as a product manager for the flow cytometry portfolio. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. All righty. So... That is our esteemed panel. And just before we jump into questions, because I know everybody is raring to go and is on the edge of their seats and hopefully not too terrified, I'm just gonna run through a couple of housekeeping items. We love to get your questions. Our panelists are ready and waiting to provide lots of insights and hopefully address your concerns. So please type those into the Q&A box. Do not worry if you are listening on demand, you will also have the chance to have your question answered. Just enter it into the Q&A box and we will reach out to you through the email that you used to register to listen in. All right, so without any further ado, I'm going to get the panelists warmed up here. As always, I like to give a couple of questions of my own just to get the brain cells going. Everybody ready? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Just making sure you're all still there. <laughs> I don't want to be answering these myself. <clears throat> all right, here we go. I have never built <clears throat> my own panel before. Where do I start? If I was to give you my samples, could you help me build a panel? And who wants to kick us off this morning? Chris. I'll take that one, Laura. Uh, right. I think my answer is no. Do it yourself. <laughs> um, that way you'll learn. Um, I'd love to be able to help all our customers uh, build their panels, but I think it would take up quite a lot of time. It is a lot of fun, though, and <clears throat> I think that the first key point is to, to not be afraid. We've all been there building our first panel, looking at all these markers, all these four floors, and not really knowing uh, what it is that we – where to start. The good news is there is a ton of resource out there, um, Starting with your local resource, if you have a core lab, they're an excellent resource to go and uh, to talk to. They're a mine of information. Um, but also uh, on our website, we have the basics of flow guide, which covers everything from how a flow cytometer works, how to acquire your data, what controls you should be using, all the way through to the best practices in data analysis. And that really is, it, it's, it really takes a very fundamental look at flow cytometry and it's very basic and on point and it's an excellent uh, resource that I actually refer to quite regularly. Um, there's other resources out there. Probably one of the most important is finding a good panel builder where you can put in your markers that you're interested in and then use the panel builder to select um, floor fours that hopefully won't overlap. Um, 
there's a few golden rules that you need to sort of look at. Um, bright fluorophores on low expressing or dim uh, markers. Um, and the opposite is true. You don't want something too bright or something that's uh, very highly expressed. Um, overlapping fluorophores need to sort of be on canonical markers on, on very separate uh, cell lineages, not on a subset, say, for instance, of a T cell memory, um, just so you can make sure you can resolve that data uh, when it comes down to the analysis. And I think a really good um, two more points. One, one is to always include a viability die. Um, we have a selection of viability dyes on our website, which uh, the Viva Fix range, which are very good. You really need to get rid of those dead cells. They absolutely will ruin your data. Um, have lots of non-specific binding goes on, and it, it can just muddy your data. So really make sure that you have a vi good viability dye in there. Um, and the last point uh, was know your cytometer. Make sure you know, you know which lasers it's got or which detectors it's got um, so you can tailor your panel to fit as well as you possibly can into that um, machine. Brilliant. I think that's it. From so me. that was it, right? <laughs> I think that's it. So there are, yeah, there are uh, numerous online sources you can go to that I recommend. One would be the, uh, the uh, cytometry uh, ISAC site. Uh, they actually have uh, many what they call OMIPs which are optimized multicolor panels. So if you're lucky, they've already done the panel for you. So you might wanna check that out. So they've gone through excruciating detail of, of titrine and voltration and all that stuff and have come up with a really optimized panel. So you might wanna check them out. And you can also go on to online um, sites like FloraFinder if you can. Um, they have our cytometer. You can put our cytometer's configuration in the FloraFinder and then as you go through and pick out uh, your your um, your markers, it will populate as you go. So that's a that's a good tool if you can use it. So there are a number of, of online sources you can go to that can help you out. Brilliant. All right. I think that's uh, that's a couple of folks warmed up. So let's get going with another one of my brain tickling questions here. Okay, so this is a question about kind of experimental setup and how many cells do I need? So how many cells would you recommend to start with or analyze when you're looking for a rare population of cells, for example, around 1% of the total cell population? What should be the experimental setup in order to achieve statistical significance? How many cells would I need? So who would like to take this one? Oh, Michelle, perfect. So there's kind of two answers. So there's the statistical answer and then there's the cytometry answer. And as you might expect, the cytometry answer is it's not so simple. So I think uh, uh, Mike sent us a uh, the, the Mario Ryder paper that goes into this particular question for cytometry. The first answer is purely statistical. So if you're a statistician, they, they have a nifty little formula to uh, come up with this very question. So from a strictly statistical standpoint, you look at things like, well, what's, what's the confidence level that you want? Uh, what's the um, margin of error that you're expecting? Uh, and if, do you know or have a guess what the standard deviation of your data is gonna be? If you plug that all into this formula, kind of the go-to minimum sample size is 30, which means you want 30 positive events. So whatever you start off with your gate, you're gonna need at least, if you do the backtracking through your, your gated data, you can come up with an answer. So if you, let's say you have, the end result is you want 30 positive rare events, it's 1%. Well, you need to start off with at least 3,000 um, good gated events, so 3,000 viable lymphocyte gates. So that that's kind of the, the short um, answer. If you go to the Mario paper, um, he disputes that. So he pretty much says that there is no minimum number. There's no minimum. There's no maximum. It all depends on your um, your controls. Uh, so it's a really good paper to look at. 
Uh, so you, you kind of have to kind of, you know, look at what, well, what you're trying to answer. So it really comes down to controls. So if, if mm -hmm. you have, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a, a rare population, more is always better. So if you can run 30, 40, 50, 100,000 cells, your stats are always going to be better. Yep, that makes sense. Because um, if you're looking for something small, you want to see that your changes or your signal is within that margin of error. So totally makes sense. Love thinking about statistics very early in the morning. Yes, my favorite subject. <laughs> uh, did anyone have anything to add on that one? Oh, Danielle, please. Uh oh, Danielle, mute, unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I think another thing to consider, and you're um, trying to decide how many events to collect is if you are tr uh, setting your instrument to collect total events, you also need to account for any of the, the population that may be gated out due to doublets or um, loss in viability. So you might have to adjust the number of total events that you collect to account for those losses in cells as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Danielle. All right, so I see questions coming in. We have a ton already. So I'm gonna pick one from the list and send it out to you all. So here we go, hold on to your seats. Can you advise how best to look at or evaluate spillover when starting running a new panel? And how would you proceed with making changes in fluorochrome combinations? That's a two-parter right there. Who would like to kick us off and take a stab at this one? Chris. Oh, maybe Chris then Danielle. Okay. Well, I think this goes back to um, the, uh, the the panel builder that we just talked about. Um, it's you know if you enter all of your markers, it should give you. The panel builds are designed that you, you shouldn't be allowed to add in um, too much um, spillover, basically. Um, and I think one of the important things to remember is your the panel that you're designing is not necessarily going to be your final panel. Um, you may find something that you've designed on one of the panel builders doesn't always necessarily work, and you might require a little bit of tweaking down the line, whether it's a different... Um, flora conjugate, floor conjugate, or if it's a different isotype, uh, sorry, different uh, different antibody. Um, you know, some, th some of them work better than others. And uh, and I, th I think that's important to remember. So um, yeah, just the panel builders are the best way of uh, looking at that spillover. And actually in Everest, which is our software for the, the ZE5, um, when you put in your markers at the beginning of your experimental uh, workflow, it'll actually show you how much spillover is is on those spectral charts as well. So that's right. a, kind of a great way of looking at it. Thanks, Chris. Danielle? Yeah, I was going to kind of say the same thing. Uh, we have uh, the BioRed Spectra Viewer is a very useful tool for this. You can see the spillover and actually uh, get the same multi-laser view that you would get in the Everest software. Um, so you can identify not only issues with spillover, but also issues with uh, cross-laser excitation. Um, and then, you know, you can adjust your panel based on the, the level of spillover that you see uh, in those tools. All right. Was that Mike? Go, Mike. Yeah. I would just say that, uh, yeah, the, the spectra viewer is, is great. So what you see what? on a spectra viewer is not always what you see on the cytometer. So what I would su suggest is an FMO control is a great way of, of seeing what spillover you're getting and spread. So uh, FMO control is, uh, is fluor fluorescence minus one control. Easy for me to say. Um, I've been drinking. No, so, um, <laughs> so this is where only, you... Only coffee, right? Just coffee because it's a coffee chat. Yeah, just coke, coke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Um, so uh, this is where you put all your fluorophores in, apart from one that you want to see what the effect of all the other fluorophores, you know, are on, on the channel you're interested in. So if you do change the fluorophore, you can then see how all the other fluorophores interact. Because remember, as every single fluorophore that you add 
will have an effect on every other floor floor within your panel. So I think that's actually a really good control to, to do as well. Brilliant. Michelle? So in, in this list of best practices, one of the first things they, they, they teach you is when you're looking at building your panel, if at all possible, for example, you want to put your brightest fluorophore with your lowest expressed antigen because you don't want you don't necessarily need very bright bright signals in highly expressed antigens if you don't need to because you don't really need to resolve them that well. So you can when you start looking at the best practices, it kind of helps guide you how you pick the fluorophores you want to put on which marker. So that that really helps uh, bring down uh, spectral the, uh, the spillover matrix uh, where you don't want it. Super. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. I think our brains are nice and warmed up now uh, with the appropriate lubrication. So here is another one from the audience. So what is a good way to normalize data? For example, we represent a cell population as a percent of live or CD45. We can see a visible increase in the population of control versus treated, but it's not reflected in the numbers. How can we resolve this issue? Ooh, this is a good one. Uh-oh. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, people. Who would like to tackle this one? It's a long question, so take some time to read it. <laughs> I uh, go, Chris. Just All go. right. If you're normalizing against, so let's see, uh, percentage of live or CD45. So presumably, um, doesn't. Yeah, you should be able to resolve that. That's pretty much how I would do it. Um, you would take your population, say it's a lymphocyte. Let's say we're doing primary cells. We've got PBMCs. We're looking at control. Uh, we're looking at B cell marker, for instance. Um, yeah, you would just normalize it against that whole population, or you could normalize it to a perhaps a more stringent marker. So if you CD45 covers a lot of cells. So if you're looking at something like PBMCs, um, that obviously contains a lot of different cell lineages, um, you might want to dial in a little bit more. Um, looking at, say it's a B cell marker or a T specific T cell marker or whichever cell you're looking at. Um, and I think that might solve your issue. It would make sure you've got um, you're gating out your debris, you're gating out your dead cells, which is very important, and make sure you're looking at single cells. Um, for this kind of experiment. That way, you're going to start off with the cleanest data possible um, in order to, to look at your actual experimental numbers that you're interested in. Um, yeah, that's what I think that's what's happening is perhaps the noise is overtaking the treatment. Brilliant. Danielle? Um, yeah, I don't, I, it might be a possibility that since your percentages have altered, been changed, but your numbers of the cells that you're looking at have not been changed, that there may actually be a change in another population that's skewing maybe the statistics of that population. So you may actually want to be looking at alternative populations in your sample that have uh, have been um, altered be, uh, in your experiment. Michelle, I saw you had your hand raised. Go ahead. So another thing you can do is you can you can employ stopping gates. So when you're uh, acquiring your data and you want to make sure that everybody's normalized to the same relative population, you put a stopping gate on that population that you want to normalize to. So that uh, you make sure, like, you, you say, well, I want to make sure that everybody is related to 20,000 lymphocytes. So you put your stop gate on lymphocytes. So everybody stops at the same number. You could do the same thing at the end. So you could say, well, if your in population is stem cells, you can say, well, I want to stop gate on 500 stem cells, and it'll just keep going until everybody reaches that same stop. So the, the, point, the downside is you have to make sure you have enough sample to do that. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. 
You can also do that after the fact in um, in some of the uh, like FCS Express and Flojo. You can normalize that way, but uh, it just goes back to thinking about how you're going to set up the the experiment and make sure you have enough sample to do that. Oh, that's great advice. I'm glad we have you on the call because I don't know if I could have answered that one myself. All right, here we go. And they're coming in fast and furious. So um, we're going to pick up the speed a little bit, hopefully, here. So how does hydrodynamic focus, oh, how is hydrodynamic focusing achieved? What is the physics involved behind it? Good Lord, physics. OK, <laughs> who wants this one? Statistics, physics. OK, go, Mike. <laughs> So believe it or not, Leonardo da Vinci first <laughs> proposed how hydrodynamic uh, focusing uh, works. So he said that if you have a quantity of liquid that is flowing through, a, you know, through a tube, the rate is proportional to the the width of the tube. And I'm probably getting some of this slightly mixed up, but it's definitely Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but anyway, what, what, basically what this means is if you narrow um, your tube, as you do at the end of a, a flow cytometer, it will flow at a faster rate because the same amount of fluid has to go through um, those going at the wider part of the, the tube. Um, so it speeds up. So then this, this means that you can focus your, 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 um, your liquid and therefore your stream of cells. Obviously very important to make sure you're only uh, interrogating one cell as it's passing through the laser, not multiple cells. Because the flow cytometer, if it has two cells go through, it still counts it as one cell. It's not that clever. Got it, okay, I like that. I think that will be the uh, quote of the day. Your flow cytometer, not that clever. I like it, all right. <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> so uh, another physics icon to throw out there is Bernoulli. So Bernoulli did all these wonderful studies and equations on fluid dynamics. And uh, if you really want to delve into it, uh, you can look into his treatise on um, uh, coaxial flow. Uh, and uh, and the dynamics of fluids in uh, in a flowing situation. So there's quite a quite a bit of uh, physics out there to explain it, and it's much more than we can go into here, really. But it I works. Think that will have to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Love it. All right. So for all those gearheads who want some more details, um, I think you can have, find lots of useful information. But thank you to the panelists for kind of uh, wetting people's appetites with a couple of ideas there. All right, so here's our next one. Mm -mm. So this person has been told that single stained color controls for compensation should be as bright or brighter than in our samples. Is this true? And do you know why they need to be as bright or brighter? Hmm. Uh oh, Michelle. So, this usually launches a heated debate <laughs> on on uh, compensation controls. So, what do you use for compensation controls? Do you use do you use cells? Do you use beads? Then, usually, the answer is it's probably a combination of both. So, uh, from my point of view, I think whenever possible, you want to use cells as your single color controls, because it shows you the exact amount of signal that you're looking for to compensate for. But what do you do if your signal isn't there? So let's say you're looking at a uh, cell type that has to be stimulated, or you're looking for something to upregulate. So what do you do there? So there you're going to have to use a bead. Uh, so what kind of bead do you use? So in the past, there was a compensation bead that was just, it had one level, one very bright level. So the problem with that one bright level is you're dealing with a, a very bright signal that's spreading all over the place that you may not need to worry about. So there's other beads out there. One one that we sell is called a Quantum Simply Cellular. It has it actually has four levels of intensity that you can use as 
uh, your compensation marker. So it has a, a dim positive, medium dim positive, medium bright positive, and a bright positive. So if you kind of know uh, what signal strength you're looking for, you can use whatever one of those peaks to set your compensation. So the, the idea is, do you always want the brightest signal that you can get? No, you don't. Because especially when you're getting into these really um, high, num uh, high parameter panels, uh, the spread is, is going to be impossible to uh, deal with. So when you look at, uh, there's some signals that are going to be dim that you don't have to compensate that much. So you don't really need a real, really bright signal. So uh, I think in the old days, when you only had to worry about three or four colors, yeah, you might want to do the brightest signal you can get. But now that everybody's up into uh, 15 plus, 20 plus colors, you have, you have to be more careful about how you set these uh, compensations. Great. Anyone, anything to add on that one? Chris? Yeah, I think uh, fundamentally, <laughs> you really need to, like Michelle was saying, you're using these different levels of, of, of beads. It really comes down to trying to match that flora for to your sample as much as possible. Under compensation, if you are using a, a, a dimmer marker and your actual sample is brighter, you're going to undercompensate. If you're using something that's as uh, is brighter than your sample, the, the risk is that in your overall panel of colors, you're going to overcompensate um, for your actual thing that you're interested in. And both of those are, are equally bad, um, especially if you're looking at a very uh, specific subset of a cell line, you risk um, losing that in the noise of the data, basically. So really trying to match your compensation brightness to your uh, uh, your sample is going to give you the best data out at the end of the day um, and hopefully help you to resolve your data. Um, there's a lot of, you know, in the in, back in the day, you you try and manually adjust your compensation, uh, moving, you know, I'm gonna, that doesn't look quite right. I'll, 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 I'll increase the compensation on that or decrease the compensation on that. With the uh, algorithms that are out there now, um, the auto compensation that, uh, FCS Express, uh, the panel that it creates, or Everest, our, our software, um, or any of the other um, flow analysis programs, you really should, if your compensation panel is set up correctly, you should really trust what the um, algorithms, the algorithms and the programs are telling you to use. And hopefully that should give you the best data out. Awesome. All right, let's move us along to one of the Many questions that we have here. All right, here we go. Um, so we've done that one. We are gonna go over here to, do you have any specific advice for flow cytometry slash sorting of small extracellular vesicles? So for example, 100 to 700 nanometers in diameter. Ah, Danielle. Um, I think for, to begin, uh, you do really want to make sure that the instrument that you're using is going to be capable of um, analyzing particles down to that size range, right? And so this is going to include having a highly sensitive um, small particle detector uh, off the 405 uh, nanometer laser. Um, other than that, you uh, the one of the biggest challenges I think in in looking at these types of small particles by flow cytometry is being able to I, identify the po the population of interest and separate it from the noise and debris uh, in both your electronics and in your sheath and sample. So my advice for that would be to um, make sure that both your sample um, and your sheath fluid are filtered prior to acquisition. And then also, uh, you know, have an instrument that has very nice um, low noise electronics. Um, and then for if, you know, if in addition to that, I suppose if you're still having trouble, um, it, it can be helpful to add uh, antibody stain on for to specifically identify those extracellular vesicles, right? Um, and then you can uh, use a fluorescent trigger to separate out that population from the noise and debris with a little bit more confidence. 
and if you happen to be someone who's using the Z5, you uh, have the ability to actually visually set this or make that adjustment by using the live threshold plot that's available on uh, the Everest software. Great. All right, and for those folks who are joining from Europe, that's the ZE5. All right, uh, <laughs> Mike. Yeah, I would, I would just um, emphasize the importance of controls in there as well. Um, how how do you know that you what you are seeing are, are exosomes? And a lot of people will use beads, but they have a different refractive index, so you can see beads a lot more easier than you can exosomes. So having the right control to make sure that your instrument is actually seeing exosomes is important. Um, and if you're staining uh, small particles, exosomes, physicals, exosomes, whatever, with antibodies, be aware that your antibodies may contain particles. So you may wish to spin your antibodies beforehand and uh, make sure that your controls are treated the same so that the same particles, if they are there, will be in the control. And use a bright fluorophore, the, the brightest you can you can uh, find, because um, the amount of antigen on a small particle will be a lot less than what is uh, available for the antibody to bind than on a cell. There's a lot less protein, so you know you need to be able to have a bright fluorophore to be able to see it. Excellent advice. Okay, here is another one from the audience. When performing longitudinal studies, how can we correct for day-to-day -day variation and gradual laser deterioration? Who would like this one? Anybody? I think, hello? <laughs> Chris, okay, Chris. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. I was waving. Go ahead. I have small hands. Uh, yeah, there you unless go. I hold them up close. They're, they're giant. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, it's difficult. Um, obviously, you've got your internal control. So every day on your instrument, you should be running QC. Um, Z5 has a QC protocol. Um, and over time, um, you should be able to track if you do have a gradual laser deterioration. Lasers nowadays are pretty reliable um it's not you know you're not adding these huge cooling boxes and giant fans and you know separate kind of power surge instruments and all that kind of stuff lasers now the solid state ones especially are, you know they're pretty good um and you can monitor those degradations if they happen over time or if you can see if anything is going wrong with your instrument um, a lot of instruments uh, the z5 for instance has um uh, a, Q, uh, a QC quality control protocol that you do on startup. And when you actually look back over time, you can see uh, your voltage is shifting. Uh, is your is your 800 laser requiring more power to get your bead population um, spot on on your, on your detector? Um, and that really is the best way to make sure that nothing is particularly going wrong. Um, how you would correct for that in a, in a, in a, in a more of a longitudinal way, I think um, is just keeping your instrument in the tip top shape, basically. Um, you know, at the end of the day, even if 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 you're you are having some kind of drift, I'm hoping that that your sort of your population would, within its its own internal controls, stay the same. Every day you're going to be running the same controls in that kind of study. So as long as you um, look back at how your controls are running and you're constantly comparing to those controls and you, I don't think you should have a problem. All righty, Michelle, you had something to. Yeah. So along with what Chris was saying is, you know, the, the ZE5 uh, has this neat little function called the QC trending, which is uh, Levi Jennings plot. So you can pull that up and you can look at your, your laser powers and your um, parameter CVs over time, you can see if it's drifting or not. And actually, you'll see if you've had a PM, things change from the PM. So we've got that built in. You can keep track of it that way. But as far as uh, keeping um, like a, a specific assay, how do you know that it's the same from day to day? Uh, you'll need to add some kind of fiduciary in your assay itself. So one thing that people might do is once you've got the assay set up, 
and you've got your your areas of interest that you you want to keep constant you can add a bead in there some some kind of bead that you know is going to be a constant that when you look at that bead and you have you'll, you'll set a marker on that bead that when you run the assay that bead has to be in that marker so you know that things haven't drifted excellent all right i will move us along thank you great advice there on the panel okay here we go would you recommend using samples for your fmo controls or something like an ultra comp e bead if using sample and you have multiple conditions eg pre or post exercise does it matter which sample you use for your fmo who would like to tackle this one danielle um, I would definitely recommend uh, using your sample and your actual cells for uh, your FMOs. I think that uh, you really are, are looking to account for the amount of spread uh, that becomes apparent in the data after you run compensation and use that as a guide for setting your populations. Um, so I think it's very important that you use your samples in, to do that. Um, for the second part of the question, if you're looking at multiple conditions, um, I think that it, depending on your experiment, you are going to want to use the sample that is going to express the your markers or your antigens, um, I think, at the highest density, because that's going to you know show you that that spread. Or you can use uh, multiple, um, I guess, if you are concerned, can use multiple uh, different samples to to as FMO controls. Uh, if there's going to be a widely different uh, profile in uh, antigen expression. Brilliant, Chris. Something to add there. I'll just say from a practical point of view, we looked at a study um, a few years ago now looking at a, um, a B cell lymphoma over time and trying to use the untreated FMO controls really just didn't work. Um, there was such a dramatic shift in the B cell lymphoma that uh, you really had to use those experimental samples as your FMO controls because trying to match that um, lymphoma as it grew to an untreated control sample was just impossible. You couldn't see your, your populations. You cert certainly can see the memory B cell populations. Um, and those are the ones, you know, if you're really trying to drill down into the data, yeah, you might be able to see sort of high, high level um, separations and, um, you know, see CD3 minus or CD3 positive. Um, but really, if you're trying to drill down into those um, sort of memory, memory subsets, then you really need to, you're going to find that those untreated controls are not probably not going to be working well for you. So use those experimental samples. And that's a pain, I know, because you may not have much of those experimental samples or those drug treated samples to use. So one shortcut, um, and I'm probably going to spark off a cytometry s storm of controversy here is if, if, if you have a very limited sample, it might not necessarily be that you need to run all your FMO controls. If you're having a particular problem with one uh, of, of, of separating out one particular subset, maybe just run those uh, FMOs. Um, it's not the best practice. The best practice would be to run everything. But if you don't have enough cells and you have no choice, um, yeah, try and drill down and be a bit more uh, choice about your uh, the, the, which FMOs you're going to try and run. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. All right. So here's another one here. We kind of touched upon it, I think, a little in the previous answer. But how can flow cytometry be applied to detect lymphomas? Mike. Simple answer, antibodies. <laughs> so um, it depends um, what lymphomas you're looking for. Um, and I, I think quite often it's the preparation of your sample is probably important here. Um, so there's the, the old saying is rubbish in, rubbish out. So if, if you don't prepare your sample very well, you're not going to get very good results. So um, have a look at what, lots of published data. 
might have to treat lymphomas with enzymes or, or you could might have to use uh, mechanical uh, disaggregation. But see what's best uh, for your lymphoma. And then find out what the best antibodies to use for your lymphoma are. Um, make sure you're using clones that are specific for flow cytometry. Uh, make check the literature, you know, what's cited. Find out what markers are present on your lymphoma. Um, and there's lots of, lots of information there. And then it comes down to building that panel, checking which markers are the dim ones and the, the, uh, the, the high abundance ones, and then mixing and matching with your fluorophores. Um, I think it's knowing the biology of your sample is sometimes just as important as knowing the, uh, the, 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 the physics of your flow cytometry. We'll see. Yeah. Preparation and uh, reading and understanding, I think, is extremely important. Brilliant. Michelle. So, like Mike said, actually, there are a ton of pre made lymphoma panels out there. So, if you go online, uh, there's many, many high level or very well respected um, clinical sites that have already done a lymphoma panel. So, if you just go start looking through them, they'll show you, you know, what, what are the best markers and how do you best set up the sample? So it's if you, if a lymphoma panel is what you're looking for, it's already been done. I love that. Always do your literature searching first. Yeah. Oh, Chris, Chris, one more thing from Chris. Uh oh, big mm -hmm. hands. Yeah, no, I was just going to say. So I was just thinking back to the B cell lymphoma panel we ran, and I think if the question is coming from a more fundamental um, point. You are, there are places you can look online, but there, there's an average number of cells that the average healthy person has. It has a certain percentage of T cells, a certain percentage of B cells. A lymphoma will be detected by a massive shift in one of those populations. So these panels are going to pick out those population shifts. For instance, with our B cell lymphoma, it's pretty obvious there's flow cytometry. You can see all your subsets of cells, and you'll have a, this. This will be your positions of T cells, and here will be your B cells. And you can see those on your actual flow cytometer. When you have a lymphoma, one of those populations is going to just blow out of the water. You'll see, you go, oh, that's pretty obvious. I've got 90% B cells. Something's not quite getting on there. So I just wanted to kind of take it back to the root level of if that's where the person was coming from, um, that's how flow cytometry works, looking at subsets, T, uh, cell subsets and changing into those population numbers. Great. Mike, oh, Mike gonna, one Mike's more thing. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna exactly. so he's gonna say that's all rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, and you might actually see some very strange populations. Uh, we were doing some uh, in vivo work, and I was actually I was actually doing it for somebody else, and they trusted me. And I went to the flow cytometer, and all the B cells were also. I think it was CD11B positive as well. So I thought, well, I've made a mistake here. I've put in the wrong antibody, the wrong fluorophore. So I collected all the data and I was uh, humbly went along and said, I think I've made a mistake. And they're like, oh, no, no, that, that's exactly what we're supposed to see. So I think that does come down to maybe some of that literature search and be prepared to see the unexpected. Yep. That reminds me of a 70s TV show, Tales of the Unexpected. <laughs> But uh, that's only for the uh, UK folks. Well, on the, must uh, have been on the time. <laughs> yeah, it was it's pretty <laughs> old. <laughs> I'm far too young for that, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's uh, keep us going here. So what is a good resource for antigen density? Mike. I just happen to know this one uh, because we have a resource on bioid antibodies. It's almost as if this was planted. Um, so we 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 um, always try to give customers advice on how to build the panels, as we're doing today. And we always say, yeah, check your antigen density. And, and there's not that much information out there. So we decided to create some. So... Um, we actually used the simply cellular beads that I think Michelle and Chris have talked about earlier uh, because they bind a set amount of antibody and you cre create a standard curve. 
And so we did this using uh, PE labeled antibodies. And so you have no antibody bound, then low, mid, and high. And you create the standard curve and you can see essentially uh, how much antibody has bound. And you then stain your cells with the same antibody, with the same fluorophore. And you basically just read off the standard curve that you've uh, created. And you get how much antigen, relative antigen density is on, on, the, on the cells for each antigen. So we have created, I think, about 20 or so for human uh, and the same for, for mouse. So uh, I think we go to biradantibodies.com forward slash antigen density, I think would probably take you straight there. Oh, bloody hell. That is pretty neat. Nice one. All right, let's move us along. Uh, I'm going to pick this one. This is, okay, here we go. This is from the UK. Uh, when you design an assay and plan to deploy it across different labs, are there decisions you would take early on to ensure the best homogeneity across instruments? I'm guessing controls, 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 um, but who would like this one? <laughs> You better volunteer or I'm going to voluntold one of you. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of a hot topic uh, for like um, CROs and clinical labs where they're doing the same assay across different sites. So how do you know that one Z5 is the same as the other Z5? So that's um, one thing that that we haven't implemented yet and we're working on is um, a full suite of instrument characterization, sort of like, hate to you know talk about the competition, like the BD, um, CSTB. So uh, a lot of work went into that, using that B to characterize each instrument. So what, what they do or what you'd have to do, would you have to characterize each instrument to see like you look at the cue, the uh, sensitivity in the background of each parameter you're looking at, and you kind of find the worst instrument for those things. And then you set up each assay based on the worst instrument. So it can be done, uh, it, but it's going to take some work on the, uh, the core manager's part. So you're going to have to kind of look at each instrument and look at look at the Qs and the Bs and find out who's the best and who's the worst, and then come up with a, a way of setting your assay so that everybody may not be exactly the same, but at least you're, you know, you're in the same ballpark. Oh, that's but we great. Are, Thank we you. are working on that. Oh, <laughs> so stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> More to come. Awesome. All right. So here's another one. Here we go. So are there any tools to help with antibody titration? Yeah, they're called postdocs. <laughs> Danielle, you want to take this one? That's nice. <laughs> Uh-oh, Danielle's on mute. <laughs> I am so sorry. Uh, I think there are tools in, in terms of... Uh, the like analysis end of, of evaluating an antibody titration. I be uh, I think that a lot of the analysis software, um, for example, FCS Express has integrated tools to help you evaluate the uh, best standard uh, stand standing index uh, for your certain titration. So that's a, a good tool that you can use on the analysis side. Um, Brilliant. All right. So we're going to try and squeeze, uh, we're going to go fast and furious through this last 10 minutes to try and get through as many as we can. So what is the best control to set the size gate for microparticles? Can beads be used for that? Go for it, Mike. Um, I think we alluded to this earlier. Um, I think you... you... You can use beads, but you have to be careful um, because of they, they have a different refractive index than microparticles. Um, 
And I think um, you have to make sure you have all the controls that we, we talked about. The, your instrument is all clean and and you you can uh, definitely see your, your real signal from electronic noise. Um, I guess some of the a better way is to use the mic microparticles really themselves rather than, than the bead. Um, but you don't always have that option. So I guess you have to be pragmatic. And as long as you're confident in your data, when you when you get the you know when you've used your bead to to set your gates uh, because you've done all the right controls, um, I don't I, I don't see a problem. Uh, maybe someone will say, "Oh yes, you do," but I think you have to do what's best for you. You know, um, remember if you're going to be, you know, this data is going to be published, then the reviewers will question anything you do. So. If you think, oh, it's a shortcut, I'll get around it, they will spot it, and if they're not happy, you're not going to get it published. So um, I guess it, it's it's on you to do the right controls that go with it. All right, let's move us along. We have the next question. I know it's always best to have as many controls as possible, but if you had to choose one, would you recommend isotype or FMOs? FMOs. Like a... <laughs> FMOs. All right, Michelle says FMOs. Chris, what do you say? Absolutely, FMOs without a doubt. You cannot analyze okay. high parameter panels without them. Danielle? I agree, FMOs for sure. Okay, Mike? FMOs. Ice type controls have their place, but FMOs. <laughs> Good. Okay, thanks, everyone. That was a unanimous decision. Hopefully that helps the audience member. Okay, so we're going to move on. So if you are using the same panel over and over, this poor person, do you have to use the same FMOs every time? Oh, dear. They sound like they're bored. Okay, Chris. Uh, it really depends on your experimental setup. If you're looking at uh, a shift in population due to drug treatment, um, you need to have those FMOs on, on your drug-treated panel as well, most likely. Um, if you're looking at a cell line, like Jerkat cells, it's probably not, not essential, right? Um, there is a lot of variability between patients, um, blood types, and, uh, you know, if you're isolating a whole blood or PBMCs, one person's blood is not going to be the same as another person's blood. So in all likelihood, uh, FMOs are going to be required. If it's something a little bit more simple than that, then, or if you're looking at the same PBMCs that have been cryopreserved, Maybe you can get away with not running them all the time, but at the end of the day, you want to be confident in your data. Um, and the only way to achieve that is probably to run your FMO controls. Brilliant. All right, we've got three questions waiting for an answer. Let's see if we can do this super quick time. Okay, here we go. Do, do, do. Oh God, and of course I picked the longest question. Okay, for staining of lymphocytes, is it valid to prepare compensation controls from the blood and use them versus another tissue that does not have as much lymphocytes as the blood? And if the answer is yes, then what is the best way to use those compensation controls to avoid any errors related to autofluorescence? So many controls. Blimey, I think I... I didn't see that it was that long when I picked it, but it's a good question. Who would like to take this one? <laughs> Danielle. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like you partially answered your own question uh, in terms of, you know, one of the rules is you really do want to have the same autofluorescence in your, your compensation controls as you do in, uh, you know, and so you would, I think it would be best, it's best practices, I think, to want to use the, the same tissue because you're going to have different levels of expression in the markers in the different tissues, especially if there's um, not as many lymphocytes in those tissues. If you have questions uh, about maybe not getting a, a bright enough signal or a good enough signal for your compensation controls when using um, a nut, the other tissue because there's not enough lymph lymphocytes, this might be a good opportunity to use like antibody binding beads for compensation as opposed to cellular material. Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna keep us going here on a roll. Hopefully this one is not 
okay, good, we've got a short one here. When using different scales such as Biex or Logisil, does it matter which scales you use to set up your cytometer or acquire your data? Ah, Chris. No. <laughs> no. It's all the same. It's just it's just different um, algorithms that show your data in a different way. The data is exactly the same. It doesn't really matter which scale you're using. It's all the same. It just it's how the data appears to you. Um, and as long as everything's on scale, um, you can use whatever you want. Just stick with it though. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you're trying to, yeah. All right, so choose one and stick with it. It's like your your lifelong partner, okay, or experiment long partner. Okay, all right. Now this is another long one. So uh, here here we go. I am trying to do facts on fibroblasts, which are very difficult to count. I will compare sample one with a lot of cells to sample two with very few cells. Will the staining be heavily affected by a number of cells? Um, if I still will acquire the same number of cells. In the case of one with more cells will appear with a marker dimmer, would that be due to higher number of cells catching the antibody and giving a lower signal? Flip your neck. Who wants this one? I know probably there's like one brain cell left between us, but I think we can do this. Michelle. Yes. So antibody antigen binding, it's an equilibrium, right? So it's a mass action um, equation. So if you have a, a lot more cells with a lot more antigen, it's gonna bind a lot more antibody. So it does make a difference in the overall signal. And, you know, usually it, it, there has to be quite a big difference between cells, but yes, if you have a, a few cells with the same stain, stain amount, it's gonna stain differently than a whole bunch of cells with the same stain amount. Fantastic. All right, are you ready? Don't be sad, but this is the last one I'm gonna uh, send to everybody. Uh, we're up against the clock at this point. Okay. All right, this person is switching from single tubes to plate-based high throughput analysis. What precautions do they need to take? Any caveats, um, software suggestions? Oh, blimey, this could be a long one, but um, we just have a couple of minutes, so uh, keep it brief, <laughs> Danielle. Okay, I will keep it brief. Um, so this is a great question. Uh, I think it's really advantageous to move into more of a high throughput acquisition in terms of saving the amount of time it takes you to acquire your samples as well as increasing your productivity. So this is probably a very good idea for you. Um, the first thing that I would say to consider is your sample concentration um, to really increase the, uh, um, the the speed of acquisition and lower the acquisition times for each plate, it's best in a high throughput sampling to reduce the amount of volume you are taking per sample as opposed to maybe the amount of volume you are taking out of that single tube. So uh, in doing this, you really wanna optimize that concentration to um, be able to get enough events in those lower volumes uh, that as, keep maintaining the same number of events in those lower volumes. On the other side of that coin, it's you really want to be sure that you're not concentrating that sample so very much that you run the risk of clogging that sample line. Um, other than that, uh, I think I would suggest, you know, uh, one of the, the things with high throughput sampling is as you are acquiring, you might not be monitoring or supervising your acquisition. So if you are not doing that, it's really important that you um, have a reliable HGS mode on your instrument that's going to be able to segment your um, wells as you're acquiring. So for example, Z5 uses an air and water gap to separate um, wells as they are being acquired. And then uh, bubble detector in the sample line uses those air and water gaps to be able to determine where one well ends and the next well begins. And so using this system, we're able to maintain well fidelity throughout the entire acquisition um, without uh, you know, shifting the read frame, even if there's a sample that has very low number of events or, or no events at all. Um, and quickly, the last software suggestions, uh, you would going to want uh, software that's capable of analyzing a high, large amounts of data and has 
plate-based analysis tools like uh, plate heat mapping and, and things like that. Um, I would say, you know, FCS Express, Flojo all have similar tools like that as well. Fantastic. Okay, everyone, you can breathe a huge sigh of relief. You did a great job. Virtual round of applause for the panelists. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think I kept you on your toes with lots of statistics and physics questions. Um, and hopefully you in the audience got some of your questions addressed. I know there are still a few that we didn't get to, but we will reach out to you by email and get those answered. So before we sign off, I just want to give a quick plug to some of the other great coffee chats that we have in the series with topics ranging from chromatography through to Western blotting, QPCR, droplet digital PCR. So take a look at those. Some are available on demand and some are still up to come live. All right. Well, thank you again to my great panelists. Thank you, Danielle, Michelle, Chris and Mike. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. And you. Uh, goodbye to everyone in the audience and uh, stay safe, everybody.